Hello, and welcome to another episode of the uh, book club. So, uh, last time we read 1.9, so I guess we will be moving on to 1.10. So I've updated Milton to the uh, the latest and greatest. So here is some stuff we were looking at. All right, so let us begin uh, 1.10. Okay, this section is titled uh, Fallacies and Pitfalls. The purpose of a section on fallacies and pitfalls, which will be found in every chapter, is to explain some commonly held, <clears throat> commonly held misconceptions uh, that you might encounter. Uh, we call them fallacies. When discussing a fallacy, we try to give a counterexample. We also discuss pitfalls or easily made mistakes. Often pitfalls are generalizations of principles that are true in a limited context. The purpose of these sections is to help you avoid making these mistakes in the computers uh, you may design or use. Cost performance fallacies and pitfalls have ensnared uh, many a computer architect, including us. Accordingly, this section suffers uh, no shortage of relevant examples. We start with a pitfall that traps many designers and reveals an important relationship in computer design. The pitfall is expecting the improvement of one aspect of a computer to increase overall performance by an amount proportional to the size of the improvement. The great idea of making the common case fast has a demoralizing uh, corollary uh, that has plagued designers of both hardware and software. It reminds us that the opportunity for improvement is affected by how much time the event consumes. A simple design problem is, illustrates it well. Suppose a program runs in 100 seconds on a computer with multiply operations responsible for 80 seconds of this time. Uh, how much do I have to improve the speed of multiplication if I want my program to run five times faster? So they said, suppose the program runs in 100 seconds. Uh, the multiply operations are responsible for 80 seconds. And uh, they want to improve the speed of the multiplication uh, such that the program will run five times faster. Well, uh, if we say a hundred, get out my calculator here. We're going to say 100 divided by 5. So that gives us 20. So we're saying um, if we want this thing to be 5 times faster, uh, we want it to take 20 seconds. Um, now the multiplication is taking 80 seconds of the 100. So um, if we got the multiplication instantaneous, so if we could magically make multiplication take zero cycles, um, that would get us to the 20. 
um, the 20 seconds that we're targeting. But it appears that it is not possible to speed up multiplication such that we would get it down to 20 because essentially you would have to remove the multiplication completely in order to, uh, to achieve that five times speed up that they want. So that is my uh, interpretation. They say the execution time of the program after making the improvement is given by the following equation known as Amdahl's law. Uh, execution time after improvement equals execution time affected by improvement uh, divided by amount of improvement uh, plus execution time unaffected. So let's write this out. So here we're going to be putting Amdahl's law. How do you spell that? All right. So Amdahl's law. is um, execution time after improvements equals um, execution time affected divided by amount plus unaffected. So that is Amdahl's law. So then um, they say for this problem, execution time after improvements uh, is 80. Um, uh, 80. 80 is the time affected. So we're saying 80 divided by some amount plus uh, 100 minus 80, so that becomes uh, 80 over n uh, plus 20. So I assume you set it equal to 0 and then solve for n, right? Or execution time after improvement equals this. So Let's call that T prime, right? So then um, but then how do you solve for N if that's equal to T prime? I mean, we need to plug in the fact that we know that um, T prime is supposed to be 20, right? So let's turn the page and see what they do. Since we want the performance to be five times faster, the new ex execution time should be 20. Yeah, so that equals 20. So then they start doing algebra, right? So you say, um, 80 over n, and then we subtract 20 from both sides, so that becomes equals 0. Um, 
So then, you know, you times both sides by n, and you get um, 80 equals 0, uh, which of course is impossible. So you know that this is an impossible task. So uh, I guess I uh, did that intuitively because I got the same result. I didn't think of it as like a formula. Um, I guess when I did it, I just thought about like, you know, what's the target that we're going for? And then, um, you know, how much faster would you have to improve it to hit that target? So it seems that Amdahl's law is pretty straightforward, I would say, at least to me. Um, so um, that is, there is no amount by which we can enhance, enhance multiply to achieve a five-fold increase in performance. If multiply accounts for only 80% of the workload, the performance enhancement possible with a given improvement is limited by the amount that the improved feature is used. In everyday life, this concept also yields what we call the law of diminishing returns. We can use Amdahl's law to estimate performance improvements uh, when we know the time consumed for some function and its potential speed up. Amdahl's law together with the CPU performance equation is a handy tool for evaluating possible enhancements. Amdahl's law is explored in more detail in the exercises. Uh, and I, you know, just reading that and thinking about that, that is a good idea. Um, it would be cool to have a, like a profiling tool that, uh, you know, shows you uh, how much time is spent like in each function, right? And then, um, having like an automatic Amdahl's law type calculation in it. So you could say like, you know, if I want so much of a performance improvement for the program as a whole, you know, here, you know, here's a bottleneck, you know, this say we have some function that's a bottleneck and we know that because we profile profiled it. And then we say, okay. Well, let's take Amdahl's law and see, you know, how much, like, we would need to improve the bottleneck to get a, um, you know, get the speed up that we're going for, you know. And I imagine most of the time it would be this kind of situation where uh, it doesn't, it, you know, you can't optimize it to the point that it'll get the speed up you're hoping for because you're going to need to optimize multiple things. Uh, you know, but it would be interesting if you just had like a tool where, you know, you say like, I want a 10% improvement in performance. And then you just like click a bunch of functions that are uh, bottlenecks. And then, you know, it automatically shows you like, you know, how far you need to go before you get to the point where you're, you know, hitting the performance improvement you want or something. I mean, maybe that's not the way to go about it, but uh, certainly this is useful in profiling. Um, having Amdahl's lawn at hand and being able to quickly and easily, you know, run the calculations with Amdahl's law to reason about the kind of improvements you're going to need to make in order to reach some tangible goal that you want to hit, uh, it's clearly a very useful tool. So let's keep reading here. Uh, we can use Amdahl's law to estimate performance improvements 
when we know the time consumed for some function and its potential speed up. Handle slot together with the CPU performance equation is a handy tool for evaluating possible enhancements. Amdahl's law is explored in more detail in the exercises. Amdahl's law is also used to argue for practical limits to the number of parallel processors. Oh, interesting. We examine this argument in the fallacies and pitfalls section of chapter six. Uh, I think um, I think Risky Five mentioned that in the chat in the past. I might be wrong. I, I feel like someone mentioned that in the chat uh, regarding, I feel like we were talking about, um, I think it was a book club episode and we were talking about uh, parallel uh, programming and the difficulties of it and um, like automating it. And I think he mentioned, I think Risky5 mentioned something about Amdahl's Law. But I could totally be remembering wrong. Uh, it's certainly annotated if he did, so <laughs> you could search for it if you're curious. Um, so there's a fallacy here. Uh, computers at low utili utilization use little power. Uh, yeah, and we already saw that, I think, at something. Like, I think we've seen some examples in the past um, where they talk about, you know, like here, um, in the last, the last section, we looked at the spec power benchmark and, uh, with target load, 0%, uh, performance is zero, of course, but it was still using, you know, 80 Watts, right? So, you know, it's, it still uses power despite low utilization. Um, so power efficiency matters at low utilizations because server workloads vary. Utilization of servers in Google's warehouse scale computer, for example, is between 10% and 50% most of the time, and at 100% less than 1% of the time. Even given five years to learn how to run the spec power benchmark well, uh, the specially configured computer with the best results in 2012 still uses 33% of the peak power at 10% of the load. Systems in the field that are not configured for the spec power benchmark are surely worse. Since servers workloads vary but use a large fraction of peak power, uh, Luis Barroso and Urs Holzel uh, argue that we should redesign hardware to achieve energy proportional computing. Uh, and said this was 2007, so I assume this is uh, a research paper. If future servers use, say, 10% of peak power at 10% workload, we could reduce the electricity bill of data centers and become good corporate citizens in an era of increasing concern about CO2 emissions. That would certainly be nice. Uh, uh, fallacy here, designing for performance and designing for energy efficiency are unrelated goals. Since energy is power over time, it is often the case that hardware or software optimizations that take less time save energy overall, even if the optimization takes a bit more energy when it is used. One reason is that all the rest of the computer is consuming energy while the program is running. So even if the optimized portion uses a little more energy, the reduced time can save the energy of the whole system. Uh, there's a pitfall here. Using a subset of the performance equation as a performance metric. Uh, we have already warned about the danger of predicting performance based on simply uh, one of the clock rate, instruction count, or CPI. Another common mistake is to use only two of the three factors to compare performance. 
So always use all three is what they're saying. Uh, although using two of the three factories may be valid in a limited context, the concept is also easily misused. Indeed, nearly all proposed alternatives to the use of time as the performance metric have led eventually to misleading claims, distorted results, or incorrect interpretations. One alternative to time is MIPS, which is million instructions per second. For a given program, MIPS is simply uh, the instruction count divided by execution time times 10 to the sixth. Um, so I don't think I'm gonna write that out on the blackboard because that one is pretty obvious, right? Uh, it says it right in the name, million instructions per second. So uh, since MIPS is an instruction execution rate, MIPS specifies performance inversely to execution time. Faster computers have a higher MIPS rating. The good news about MIPS is that it is easy to understand, and quicker computers mean bigger MIPS, which matches intuition. There are three problems with using MIPS as a measure for comparing computers. First, MIPS specifies the instruction execution rate, but does not take into account the capabilities of the instructions. We cannot compare computers with different instruction sets using MIPS, since the instruction counts will certainly differ. Second, MIPS varies between programs on the same computer. Thus, a computer cannot have a single MIPS rating. For example, by substituting the uh, by substituting for execution time, we see the relationship between MIPS, clock rate, and CPI. So MIPS is equal to instruction count over instruction count times CPI divided by clock rate, uh, which is the execution time, right? And that's something we've seen in previous equations. Uh, let me show that on the blackboard, because I'm sure we wrote it, or I guess whiteboard would be the more appropriate name, virtual paper. Uh, so yeah, right here, CPU time is instruction count times CPI divided by clock rate. So they just substituted instruction count times CPI over clock rate for execution time in the equation. And then, of course, that's all times 10 to the sixth. Uh, and that simplifies uh, to clock rate over CPI times 10 to the sixth. Uh, so what I always like to do when it comes to algebraic simplification is to go to Wolfram Alpha and let it do it for me. <laughs> so if we go to Wolfram Alpha, uh, we should see it simplify it to the same thing. So we're going to say, um, so the equation is instruction count. So I'm going to call that I, and let's call uh, CPI uh, C. We'll call clock rate uh, R. So yeah, we do uh, I divided by I times C divided by R. So I times R divided by I times C um, divided by R times 10 to the sixth. And all this needs to go in parentheses. Let's double check that I got that right. I over I times CPI over clock rate uh, times 10 to the sixth. And it should give us R divided by C times 10 to the sixth.
and you see that's exactly what it gives us. It gives us uh, r divided by, and instead of doing uh, 10 to the 6, they expanded it out, um, but that's 10 to the 6 times c, right? So um, we get the same result. So ultimately, uh, MIPS is equivalent to clock rate divided by CPI times 10 to the 6th. Uh, the CPI varied by a factor of 5 for a spec CPU 2006 on an Intel Core i7 computer in figure 1.18, uh, so MIPS does as well. Finally, and most importantly, if a uh, new program executes more instructions, but each instruction is faster, MIPS can vary independently from performance. Consider the following performance measurements for a program. So we have a table here with three columns. The first column is measurement, uh, the second one is computer A, and the third one is computer B. So the measurement is instruction count, uh, computer A had 10 billion, computer B had 8 billion. Uh, the clock rate is 4 gigahertz for computer A and 4 gigahertz for computer B. The CPI is uh, 1 for computer A and 1.1 uh, for computer B. So uh, they ask us a few questions here. Which computer has the higher MIPS rating? So uh, we know the clock rate divided by the CPI times 10 to the 6th uh, gives us um, the MIPS. So if I say OK, we're going to do 4 gigahertz divided by 1 times 10 to the 6th. I guess really, you know, since they're both times uh, 10 to the 6th, we could really just um, say 4 over 1, you know, like 4, and then 4 over 1.1 1 .1 gives us 3.6. So uh, the higher MIPS rating goes to computer A, uh, now they ask us uh, which computer is faster. So um, so computer A took uh, 10 billion instructions. Whereas computer B took 8 billion. So if we think about um, the actual execution time, right, uh, computer A is going to be um, 10 billion times 1. So I'm just going to say 10, right? Uh, so 10 divided by 4, so 2.5. Okay. And now we're going to say 8 uh, times 1.1 for computer B. And that gets divided uh, again by 4, right? So that gives us 2.2. So computer A took 2.5, I didn't do the units, <laughs> so 2.5 some amounts, you know, some unit of time, and computer B took 2.2 some unit of time, um, and of course the unit of time is the same in both of those, so computer B took less time according to my calculations. So computer B would be 
the faster your computer. And isn't that what MIPS told us to? I was expecting this example would give us uh, something where that was not the case. So like clock rates, eight or uh, four, sorry. Four divided by 1.1, 1 .1. or no, it was computer A that had the higher rating, wasn't it? Because uh, computer B had 3.6 and computer A had four. So uh, if you were going by MIPS, uh, higher rating is better. So according to MIPS, computer A is better. But if you actually look at the execution time, uh, computer B is better. So let's go to the next page. Okay, so that was the end of um, the end of 1.10. So I suppose we should go on to 1.11. So 1.11 is concluding remarks, and then uh, we'll also do 1.12 because it's just a couple paragraphs. Uh, next time we'll do 1.13, uh, and I think either next time or tonight we'll go over the answers to the check your cells. So, uh, 1.11, concluding remarks. Uh, although it is difficult to predict exactly what level of cost uh, slash performance computers will have in the future, it is a safe bet that they will be much better than they are today. To participate in these advances, computer designers and programmers must understand a wider variety of issues. Both hardware and software designers construct computer systems in hierarchical layers, with each lower layer hiding details from the level above. Uh, this great idea of abstraction is fundamental to understanding today's computer systems, but it does not mean that designers can limit themselves to knowing a single abstraction. Perhaps the most important example of abstraction is the interface between hardware and low-level software, called the instruction set architecture. Maintaining the instruction set architecture as a constant enables many implementations of the architecture, presumably varying in cost and performance, to run identical software. On the downside, the architecture may preclude introducing innovations that require the interface to change. There is a reliable method of determining and reporting performance by using the execution time of real programs as the metric. Uh, this execution time is related to other important measurements we can make by the following equation. Uh, seconds per program is equal to instructions per program times clock cycles per instruction times seconds per clock cycle. And uh, I believe that is this this equation right here, right? It is. So we saw that equation once before. We will use this equation and its constituent factors many times. Uh, remember though that individually the factors do not determine performance. Only the product, which equals execution time, is a reliable measure of performance. Uh, the big picture Execution time is the only valid and unimpeachable measure of performance. Many other metrics have been proposed and found wanting. Sometimes these metrics are flawed from the start by not reflecting execution time. Other times a metric that is sound uh, in a limited context is extended and used beyond that context or without the additional clarification needed to make it valid. That's the big picture here. All right, so the key hardware technology for modern processors is silicon. Equal in importance to an understanding of integrated circuit technology 
is an understanding of the expected rates of technological change as predicted by Moore's law. And again, like I say, I think that's a little bit out of date now. But uh, anyway, while silicon fuels the rapid advance of hardware, new ideas in the organization of computers have improved uh, price and performance. Two of the key ideas are exploiting parallelism in the program, uh, normally today via multi multiple processors, and exploiting locality of accesses to a memory hierarchy, typically via caches. Energy efficiency has replaced die area as the most critical resource of microprocessor design. Conserving power while trying to increase performance has forced the hardware industry to switch to multi-core microprocessors, thereby requiring the software industry to switch to programming parallel hardware. Parallelism is now required for performance. Computer designs have always been measured by cost and performance, as well as other important factors such as energy, dependability, cost of ownership, and scalability. Although this chapter has focused on cost, performance, and energy, the best designs will always strike the appropriate balance for a given market among all the factors. And then we have a roadmap for this book. At the bottom of these abstractions is the five classic components of a computer. Data path, control, memory, input, and output. Uh, these five components also serve as the framework for the rest of the chapters in this book. So data path is covered in chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 6, and appendix B. Control is covered in chapter 4, chapter 6, and again appendix B. Memory is covered in chapter 5, input in chapters 5 and 6, and output in chapters 5 and 6. As mentioned above, Chapter 4 describes how processors exploit implicit parallelism. Chapter 6 describes the explicitly parallel multi-core microprocessors that are at the heart of the parallel re revolution. And Appendix B describes the highly parallel graphics processor chip. Chapter 5 describes how a memory hierarchy exploits locality. Chapter 2 describes instruction sets the interface between compilers and the computer, and emphasizes the role of compilers and programming languages in using the features of the instruction set. Chapter 3 describes how computers handle uh, arithmetic data, and Appendix A introduces logic design. All right, uh, 1.12, historical perspective and further reading. For each chapter in the text, a section devoted to a historical perspective can be found online on a site that accom accompanies this book. Uh, we may trace the development of an idea through a series of computers or describe some important projects and we provide references in case you are interested in probing further. The historical perspective for this chapter provides a background for some of the key ideas presented in this opening chapter. Its purpose is to give you the human story behind the technological advances and to place achievements in their historical context. By studying the past, you may be better able to understand the forces that will shape computing in the future. Each historical perspective section online ends with suggestions for further reading which are also collected separately online under the section Further Reading. The rest of section 1.12 is found online. Oh, okay. So, um, they didn't give the URL <laughs> to, to um, the online aspect of this section. So I wonder if that was in like a preface? Um, uh, 
Let me see here, guys. So the preface uh, mentioned The preface mentions um, the publisher's site uh, linking to apparently a bunch of stuff relating to to this book that might be what we're looking for or maybe that will link us to what we're actually looking for. I'm surprised they didn't make it clearer. You'd think in that chapter where they introduced the fact that there's online companion material, you'd think they'd actually link you to the online companion material. Like, it's not stupid to put a hyperlink in a book, you know? Uh, if you're reading it as a PDF, it's very nice to have that hyperlink. And even if you're not, you can at least you know, if you know the URL, you can at least type it in <laughs> and uh, get to it that way. So, okay, let me go back to where I saw that link in the preface. Okay. So we are going to textbooks.elsevier.com slash let's see did I get that right so far textbooks.elsevier.com looks right okay slash Nine seven eight zero one two eight nine seven eight zero one two eight. I assume this is like the ISBN number. Nine seven eight zero one two eight one two two seven five four. I uh, must have typed it wrong. I got a 404. Let's see, 9780128122754. Textbooks.elsevier.com. Uh, I think I typed it right. Let me let me look closer here. Yes, I typed it right, as far as I can tell. Um, so that link is a no-go. Um,
So yeah, um, that did not work. Let's search um, computer organization and design historical perspective 1.12, I believe it was. Yeah. Maybe we can find it through Google. Okay, so here's a link to the publisher's website. Okay, this has got uh, online companion materials linked. Okay, here we go. So, historical perspectives and further reading. Let's click that. Chapter 1. Oh, wow, it's, it looks like it's given us a nice little PDF here. I do prefer reading the physical book over the reading a PDF to you guys, but... Uh, now you guys can kind of get in on the action a little bit and see uh, see what I'm reading to you guys. So uh, I think we're actually going to read this another day. Uh, we'll do this. Um, we'll treat it like a normal chapter of the book and read it before 1.13, right? So that'll be in the next book club episode. Uh, and then 1.13 has a bunch of exercises for us to do. Um, and then uh, let's just go through the check yourself quick, the answers to them, since I believe we're done with check yourself now. So on 1.1, page 10, uh, it was discussion questions. Many answers are acceptable. 1.4, page 24. Uh, DRAM memory, volatile, short access time of 50 to 70 nanoseconds. And cost per gigabyte is $5 to $10. So yeah, they actually expected you to look this stuff up. But, you know, I don't know how well that's going to age. Uh from when they took these values to whatever the values are today, you know. Uh, but anyway, disk memory, non-volatile access times are 100,000 to 400,000 times lower than DRAM, and cost per gigabyte is 100 times cheaper than DRAM. Flash memory is non-volatile, Access times are 100 to 1,000 times slower than DRAM, and cost per gigabyte is 7 to 10 times uh, cheaper than DRAM. All right. And then um, 1.5, we had page 28. Uh, 1, 3, and 4 are valid reasons. Answers. Answer five can be generally can be generally true because high volume can make the extra investment uh, to reduce die size by say ten percent a uh, good economic decision, but it doesn't uh, have to be true. So I don't remember what I answered on that one. Let's go check the Risky Business Archive. So, uh, 1.5, 1.5, here we go. Let's use the annotations to skip to the check yourself. Uh, 
Okay, so this has got multiple chapters in it. 1.5, 1.6, do so we want the first check yourself? So... No, I did not want to go here. Why does it always do that for me? I don't like that. Grace, uh, an example of the four future verse, uh, which is the inverse of the block period. In the next subsection, we will formalize the relationship between the clock cycles of the hardware designer and the seconds of the computer user. Uh, so here we have a check yourself section. Suppose you know that an application that uses both personal mobile devices and a cloud is limited by network performance. For the following changes, state whether only the throughput improves, both response time and throughput improve, or neither improves. Uh, so these are letters. Uh, A is an extra network channel is added between the PMD and the cloud, increasing the total network throughput and reducing the delay to obtain network access, since there are now two channels. B is uh, the networking software is improved, thereby reducing the network communication delay, uh, but not increasing throughput. C is more memory is added to the computer. Is this check yourself so for 1.6? Yeah, I'm listening to chapter 1.6. Uh, so okay, we want this check yourself. Uh, in B, they said the networking software is Stop doing that, YouTube. Bad. Bad YouTube. <laughs> Just follow the link. I don't want to edit. Didn't even take the link. So we're stating whether only the throughput improves. YouTube, get your shit together, work. man. Uh, so B, the woes of being the the creator of the channel. Stop, <laughs> YouTube, please, don't do this to me. Okay, we're gonna try clicking it one more time, and if it doesn't go, I'm gonna manually move it. So, so we want this right here. And it does it again. That is really stupid, YouTube. I should be able to click my own timestamps. That is that is kind of bullshit. So it was twenty nine eleven. We're going there manually. Depending on the defect rate. And the size of the die and wafer costs are generally not linear in the die area. Okay, uh, a key factor in determining the cost of an integrated circuit is volume. Uh, this is a check yourself section. Which of the following are reasons why a chip made in high volume should cost less? Uh, with high volumes, the manufacturing process can be turned to a particular design, increasing the yield. Uh, uh, can be tuned to a particular design, increasing the yield. Uh, second one is it is less work to design a high volume part than a low volume part. Third one is the masks used to make the chips are expensive, so the cost per chip is lower for higher volumes. Fourth one is engineering development costs are high and largely independent of volume. 
thus the developer cost per die is lower with high volume parts. And fifth one is high volume parts usually have smaller die sizes than low volume parts and therefore have higher yield per wafer. Okay, so a key factor in determining the cost uh, is volume, which of the following are reasons why a chip made in high volume should cost less. Um, so let's think about number one. With high volumes, the manufacturing process can be tuned uh, to a particular design, increasing the yield. Um, well, my understanding here is the entire process here is to design a specific uh a specific chip so like um uh like the example they gave of a wafer of i7 cores from intel right like that's a specific uh processor um so i mean it doesn't talk about in the book if they do something different if they're dealing with low volume um I mean, clearly with high volumes, they do uh, have it tuned to the particular design, so to speak, uh, because they're producing that design. So I'm not sure about that one. Uh, number two, it is less work to design a high volume part than a low volume part. Um, no. I mean, the work to design the parts, this is about manufacturing. Uh, you're going to have to put as much work into designing it, regardless of how many you're making, right? Uh, I don't think two is relevant. Uh, the mass used to make the chip are expensive, so the cost per chip is lower for higher volumes. Um, it didn't talk about the cost of masks, did it? I don't think this chapter talked about that, the cost of masks. I mean, I know we discussed masks, but... Let me see here. Where did it mention masks? I'm uh, not seeing it now. But I'm pretty sure they didn't talk about the cost of that part of the manufacturing. Uh, number four is engineering development costs are high and largely independent of volume. Thus, the development cost per die is lower with high volume parts. Um, engineering development costs are high and largely independent of volume. Yes, that, that would be true, uh, which is also why number two didn't make sense. Um, thus, the development cost per die is lower with high volume parts. Makes sense to me, right? Um, number five, high volume parts usually have smaller die sizes than low volume parts and therefore have higher yield per wafer. I believe that would be true. Uh, if you're producing something in low volume, you're probably not going uh, with one of the cutting edge uh, nanometer processes, right? Like the high five one is using a pretty old one, for example, uh, because that's more economical, right, for them. And I'd say that'd be a good example of a low volume, right? The uh, high five one and the chips that they have uh, would not be high volume as compared to something like an i7, right? Um, so with number four, I want to say, um, I think it's true that engineering development costs are high and largely independent of volume. and um, so they're saying the development cost per die is lower with high volume parts. Uh, that seems kind of weird to me to put it phrase it that way. Like, obviously, if you're producing high volume, it's going to be more economical for you. Um, but to say it's because the development cost per die, like, it doesn't really make sense to talk about the development cost per die. Because the development cost is independent to the uh, cost of manufacturing. Uh, in terms of scaling it, the manufacturing process, um, you know, it's a, it's a question of how much uh, money you're willing to put in, the initial investment to produce that many, and then, um, you know, to be able to turn around and sell that for a profit. You know, that's more of an economical thing, I think. But due to economics, the higher volume will be uh, a more beneficial thing for you um, when you're doing high volume. So it's number one and number three were the ones that I don't really understand what they're saying. So number three was the masks used to make the chip are expensive, so the cost per chip is lower for higher volumes. I don't really understand what they're saying there. The mask um, isn't the mask like uh, what they're drawing on the wafer before they cut it up? Um, like, wouldn't they reuse the same mask? Like, in my mind, when I'm thinking of when they say mask, I'm thinking that this is like the blueprint that they follow to uh, uh, dope the, the wafer, uh, to actually create the, the dyes on the wafer. Because, like, it's more economical for them to uh, have those uh, partially cut off dyes on the sides of the wafer, right? Because it's a, a circular thing, but they're making these rectangular dyes. Uh, so the mask um, includes all of that. So I mean, to me, the mask is like a one-time thing, isn't it? Unless they're saying the mask is like the actual, uh, the actual thing that they're uh, uh, doing to the the silicon itself. 
But if I'm understanding it correctly, I think no, that it wouldn't matter because it's like a one one time thing. Um, or well, I guess, but see, we don't know how expensive the mask is. I mean, it would be true that it's less expensive if you're producing more chips, right? Because that overhead cost is fixed, and so that goes down the more chips you're producing, like it becomes less significant, uh, which is part of the whole thing what I was saying about with it being more economical to produce in bulk, right? You're taking those one-time costs, and those become less significant because you're going to have a higher profit margin because you have more product, right? So I think that's all you can really say about that uh, because they didn't actually talk about the cost of the masks. Um, but I think from an economic point of view, what I just said makes sense, right? Um, and then the first one was, with high volumes, the manufacturing process can be tuned to a particular design, increasing the yield. Um, so, I mean, I guess what they're saying is tuning to increase yield. Uh, no, we're not tuning to increase yield. Right? We're not doing anything special in that regard. Um, I don't think, at least as far as what we read in the book, I didn't see anything that makes it seem like, depending on how much you produce, they would specialize it to try to get a better yield. <coughs> I mean, um, it's true if you're talking about going to a... Uh, a smaller size nanometer process, right? That will increase your yield. And you might do that if you're uh, higher volume. Uh, like I say, the uh, Sci-5's um, chips that they, they, the FE310s or whatever, the one that's in the, um, the Hi-5 one, that's a good example of what I would consider a low volume uh, chip. And uh, that's produced, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head what the uh, nanometer process was, but uh, I remember looking it up and it's, it's one of the older ones. Whereas something like an i7 is using, you know, one of the more cutting edge ones. And as a result, they're getting better uh, yield uh, because there's more dyes packed onto a wafer. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say about that. Uh, now let's let's see. Uh, yeah, I've still got time. We're gonna move on to. Uh All right. So uh, I had said that. Um, For five, I said it was uh, true, and I mentioned the that it would be a good economic decision, which is what they talk about in the answer here, but they do say it doesn't have to be true. It's generally true, but it doesn't have to be true. All right, um, I believe I said four was true. Um, I said two was not true. Um, for three, I was kind of on the fence. I said no, but then I gave like economic reasons why it would. And they say that three is valid. And then for one, uh, I already forgot what I said for what, uh, So when I said it was true uh, in the sense of if you're going down to uh, a smaller nanometer process and I talked about like the Hi-5-1 being ex an example of using an older uh, technology, uh, you know, an older nanometer process. Um, um, so they don't give explanation here, but they do just say that one is a valid reason. All right. So then uh, 1.6, we had page 33. Um, so it says one, uh, there was an A, B, C. And uh, it says A is both, B is latency, uh, C is neither. And then it says seven seconds. So let's find that check yourself and see what I had to say.
I'm going to switch this to my uh, my personal channel so that it doesn't do this stupid go to edit the video thing every time I click a fucking timestamp. <laughs> Now it's not even letting me show more. Come on, YouTube. You can do it. This is pretty sad. Welcome to the internet. So it would appear that YouTube refuses to load for this user. So we're going to go back. Oh, it's not even going to let me click that button. No, can't click that button. Can I click this button? No, can't click that button. So we're going to skip these answers and we will look at them again another day. Uh, let's see here. Um, so we're going to skip the 1.6s. Uh, 1.10 is what we just did, so we can look at those. Uh, page 51. Uh, computer A has the higher MIPS rating, but computer B is faster. That is what I said. Okay, and that's the end of that. So, next episode, if YouTube is not such a complete piece of shit, uh, we will do um, 1.6, the check yourself answers, comparing what I said and uh, what the actual answers are. Uh, but, uh, I mean, who knows if YouTube will not be a complete piece of shit. Yeah. It is what it is. So, but uh, we will also do the 1.12, um, the online material for 1.12, and we will do the 1.13 exercises. So, uh, anyway, thank you everyone who tuned in today, and thank you everyone who watches on the uh, YouTube archive, uh, which is available at risky.tv. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at HMN underscore Risky to get updates about the series. Um, 
I also want to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon. You make the series possible. And if you would like to uh, financially support the series and what I do, um, you can do so at patreon.risky.tv. I will see you in the next episode, and stay risky, everyone.